Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 31st episode of Tissues of the Day, a comedy show about queer culture and relationships. I'm your host, David, and I'm joined today by my dapper co-host, Robert. Today's episode is about empathy. We're going to talk about Dave Chappelle's recent special, and we're going to have a larger chat about empathy and maybe close with improv if we're feeling it. We might not be feeling it. All dependent we'll upon see. the vibe. <laughs> Yeah. So as we get started, remember that there is video of the podcast on the BitButton YouTube channel and audio wherever you get podcasts. If you've been listening and aren't aware, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash BitButton. One-time donations and tips are also appreciated. No pressure. But also, if you listen, that's cool too. Maybe leave a comment. What do you think? Maybe email us at bitbuttbiz at gmail.com. <laughs> Your thoughts. I, I would love to have more of a conversation going with the people who are listening to the show. So, Robert, Dave Chappelle uh, <laughs> it's is a comedian. Me. Is a comedian. I thought you said he's Canadian, and I was like, no, he's not. <laughs> is a comedian most famous for the Chappelle show in the early 2000s. Um, has always really liked pushing buttons and pushing boundaries. I think that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. And people will watch the Chappelle show today and be like, you can't make that anymore. Um, which is fine i think i want to talk about gosh where to even begin this is just going to be a big big chat um i think free speech is important i think free disagreement yes. is important i yes. think it's okay to not have all the answers and i think it's okay to like correct people publicly and to like call them out when you disagree with them tastefully so. but i but i also think that we have a real problem with learning and empathizing with people whose experiences we don't understand um, mm. because empathy limits us to only putting our lens onto someone else's experiences. I don't know what it's like to have dark skin. I don't know what it's like to feel wrong in my body or feel like I'm the wrong gender. So I do my best to trust people who have those qualities to tell me about their experience. And mm. that's it. That's empathy or at the very least sympathy, because it's not really that important for me to understand like how they are experiencing life. It's just important to. To respect it, <laughs> like just respect mm. where they're coming from, like mm. mutual respect is so important. And I think we're really struggling with that. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I always think of the Brene Brown animation about empathy versus sympathy. So I always think mm -hmm. about that, like empathy is that bear who comes and sits beside the fox and makes them feel better by saying like, you know, I hurt too, or I've been through a similar situation or I've like, you know, it's sort of saying like, that sounds tough. Whereas the antelope, I think it is, is the one who looks down on the situation and is like, oh, sucks for you. So it's sympathizing with them. That's shitty, but it's like detaching yourself from it and just sort of like putting it's it's sort of like it's still an attempt at being empathetic, but just more removed. And they <laughs> I remember the moment where it was like, do you want a sandwich? The like antelope offers a sandwich like somehow that's going to solve the situation. And I think that's just a good example of sympathy is that more removed thing where it's just like you think you can solve the situation by like doing something or saying something. And sometimes that's not actually it. You just have to empathize and let the other person come to their own healing. I think, too, there's our tendency to want to fix things and to be uncomfortable with other people's emotions. I think that's mm -hmm. a very human response to mm -hmm. difficult emotions like anger or grief or whatever. And we're both fixers, right? Like we both identified that yeah. we're fixers. So it's like totally a problem <laughs> for us. Yeah, yeah. So when we're faced with someone who is talking about their pain it's i think it's very easy to be like okay well we need to do something about this i need to like do something about this and then it yeah. becomes more about me taking it on me trying to like do stuff and less about just being there for this other person who's in pain like you're yeah. not actually being as supportive of them as you could be if it was just like fuck that really sucks i'm here for you what do you need like yeah. instead of like just jumping to action because i can't handle being uncomfortable am i making yeah, sense 
No, totally. It's kind of like it's kind of like if that bear who is giving empathy ultimately is like, I know what to do, and then gets up and walks away from the fox. Again, I'm referencing this Bernay Bound an- animation thing that she does. Yeah, that, that no, concept. I think that's lovely. And and they walk away because they're like, I'm going to do a thing to solve this, and in doing so, they leave the situation of empathy. They leave the situation of just sitting there and being there and looking to the person who's hurting, the person in the situation, um, for uh, guidance or for them to make a call. You know, for them to make the next step it's you taking on the ownership of taking the next step and doing something and that can be difficult because like i often see as a fixer that like that f- resolution means the pain stops but it doesn't always necessarily correct oof oof boy howdy because oh yeah <laughs> yeah that's a big Ma- one <laughs> howdy. we cannot control other people's feelings <laughs> No. point blank no. so so i'm not going to really spend that much time talking about Chappelle's exact talking points in the special i'm not going to play any clips from it because ultimately i think he just has a limited take on the situation um and i don't think my opinion or robert's opinion if i may be so bold are mm-hmm. that important in this conversation like we are queer men we're very sympathetic to other people but our voices aren't like really needed here (laughs) but i want to talk about this because i really love comedy and i believe in empathy and i believe in intersectionality (laughs) so which literally is what that topic's all about right it it crosses over all those yeah so i'm gonna read a couple excerpts from a letter written by dahlia bell who's a trans woman comedian of color who wrote a response in the guardian about this special and so she she says she's 40 she does not really care that much about this special but it was just how focused it was on the issues of transness and a particular thing that uh, Chappelle does in the content of the show where he's basically using a trans friend that he made in the comedy community to basically justify almost his entire perspective um so Yeah, so I'm just going to get into it. Uh, She starts, Dear Dave, we're both comedians. I guess that makes me a member of your tribe. I'm sure you've never heard of me, though, and I can think of at least three reasons for that. I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm transgender. I.e., quote, a trans, close quote. So I'm not going to say all of these, but like, Chappelle basically says every slur for a trans person over the course of this special and it's like how do you show your your growing understanding of these people while also using slurs against them like clearly it just didn't connect he's trying so hard to make it connect while still using the t-slur he calls like he says the transgenders Instead of like trans people, which is also showing how little research he's doing and like how little reading he, he's doing. Uh, well, well, he repeatedly, yeah. he only says the LBGTQ community instead of the LGBTQ community, which is just like, it's just weird. That one's more weird to me than it is offensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also like, he's just not reading. He's not listening to people. Yeah. <laughs> if he If he feels... Yeah, if he's calling it the LBGTQ community and even stutters while he says it, which is just like, are you aware or are you It sounds like it sounds like he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He's quoted as saying, I'm team turf. Um in the thing. That's not a good thing. That's not a one which is team you want to No. Yeah. So yeah, and before before I keep reading, um before I keep reading Bell's article, I wanna say too, like, uh yeah, it's just obvious. Like, he just didn't do the research because there's another point where he goes, um, oh, what was I just saying? Uh, the Team Turf thing? The Yeah, I'm Team Turf. Right, because he goes um, that he agrees with the Turf position. For anybody who doesn't know, it means trans erase, trans erasing, Exclusive. Radic- trans exclusionary radical yeah, feminist. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, and... Basically, most TERFs believe that sex is a fact. But the thing is, most trans people believe that sex is a fact. What Chappelle got wrong was he goes gender is a fact. And he 
misattributes that to being a turf position, which is not a turf position. Um, and most people can acknowledge in some ways that gender is a construct or it's like a socially kind of sanctioned thing. Like people just find codifiers for gender and some trans people believe in conforming to gender norms and some trans people don't. And most non, excuse me, most non-binary people don't believe in gender norms at all because they're just like this is like oppressive to everybody why do we even talk about gender norms as if they're important so anyway i have so many thoughts about this is, <laughs> do you want to jump in at all well <laughs> before i, I mean, continue you know, reading one of the first things that like comes up especially when you say he uses the terminology like a uh, trans or the you mm-hmm. know like the the trans or whatever was it it's the or uh i can't remember now i think it's he's quoted oh, as a saying trans. a trans, trans and he regularly says like the transgenders are like saying yeah. this and this and it's like no one says that man <laughs> well some people do but they're probably not the best people to be quoting um right right what i i just have a really hard time with because he is a bipoc individual who has probably gone through his own fair share of like trials and tribulations that i'll never be able to relate to but one of the traditional things in the world of language that you generally don't want to do to people when you want to make them feel included is use terminology like the trans a trans the uh like separation because what it is is othering people and so if you're it just confuses the hell out of me that you're like this person who's probably been othered most of his life is now othering other people and it's just like it, you're you're just swapping one word for another and why would you do that why would you want to proliferate that concept and Um, You know, when you were talking at the beginning of the show around how, like, I believe in freedom of speech, I believe in freedom of comedy, and I don't even know quite how else to say it, but it's just like, I'm fine with entering into the world of comedy, context of comedy, and, like, it's almost like, laugh at whatever you want, make fun of whatever you want. However, that doesn't mean that comedy as a art form, as a subject, can't evolve. So it's just like, as years go by and we progress socially and as you know rights and all that and within the world that there's going to be stuff that's just less funny over time and so it's like this this is falling into that category now because it's that much more in the spotlight that's much more education going on and it just seems like he didn't go through any of it or let any of it absorb because he's using terms like a trans the trans that whole othering yeah yeah and so i'll come back to this point but this is kind of the fundamental like difficulty with empathy is like, how do you empathize with somebody who's criticizing you? So I think a lot of, how do you empathize with somebody else who is criticizing you or criticizing Mm -hmm. your identity? So Chappelle is very much coming from the perspective of a black man and his like so much in the show is about, him feeling defensive because he feels like the black experience is harder than the trans experience. What he forgets and what Bell starts talking about is there are black trans people, Dave. <laughs> so also, he like comes uh, up with complete straw man arguments saying like, can a gay person also be racist? And the audience is like, yes. And it's like, okay, but that's not what we're talking about right now. <laughs> we're talking about intersectional like oppression we're not talking about who has it worse because of this like one aspect of their identity and so dave just like loses that anyway (laughs) um so bell goes i feel like there was some other thought i had oh yeah having empathy for the people criticizing you and so i think also the same thing is happening from the queer community where like they feel criticized by dave Chappelle, and they feel like Chappelle is punching down on them so if you have two people who are feeling criticized by each other and both firmly believe that they are being punched down onto, Mm. then you're never going to get anywhere. So I'll come back to that point Mm. when I start talking about like bigger empathy things. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So Belle continues in her letter. She goes, watching the special reminded me of just how influential you had been on my early stand up and understanding of comedy. Your formulaic joke structure and all too predictable edgelord punchlines took me right back to my very first year performing at open mics. But hey, you've been doing this for 33 years. That's no small achievement. It only makes sense that you might run out of new ideas. Even so, as a longtime fan, something I always admired about comedy was its ability to push boundaries and challenge norms. Mm -hmm. Now it's 2021, and I think we can all agree that bitter old men griping about progress are killing comedy. Just 
just let that breathe for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Uh, all right. She goes, I couldn't help but think this dude is 48 years old, been doing comedy for 33 years and still hasn't built up a thick enough skin to take criticism. It's rather sad, actually, because as comedians, it's our job to say shit for money. There's no obligation on anyone else to approve of the stupid shit we say, which brings us to our next issue. Yeah. Chappelle opens a special saying, I'm rich and famous. <laughs> like that's just oh, what he starts saying. Um, as if that's like an excuse for like all <laughs> Everything that's the stuff <laughs> that follows. Yeah. It's, it's really something. Um, so the author goes, what's it called when a troll says every offensive thing they can think of to distract their audience from the shitty belief they're trying to defend deflection. Yeah. That's the best section of what devolves into a Ted talk for turfs, starting with Chappelle's torturous claim to being a feminist for the first time ever. To be fair, his observation about white America being more appalled by black people repeating on stage what we've heard our black mothers say than they are. Oh God. What we've heard our black mothers say than they are by a black man murdering another is valid. But the problem being, in the context of the special, it's only about as valid as saying, what about black on black crime? Like, there's a lot of what about isms in the special, too, um, because so what uh, what Bell is referring to there is when um, Dave Chappelle basically says uh, that the rapper DaBaby came more under fire for his comments about the gay community and like very like tasteless jokes about mm -hmm. AIDS, like people getting AIDS in the parking oh, lot outside yeah, of his yeah, like yeah. Uh, concert. Um, and people were just like, what the fuck? And so he seemed to be a bit canceled over those comments. And Chappelle was saying, why is that a bigger deal than when he shot and killed somebody in a Walmart? Um, which is like a very weird thing to bring up. It's like, I think both are important. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and what what is his measure of bigger? Like, they both probably got media coverage. I'll never be able to measure the bigness of one story over another, you know, when it comes to, like, subject that much. I, I also, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I definitely heard about the baby stuff towards the queer community as opposed to the shooting. But I also don't listen to the news a lot. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, when he shot somebody... It was like even a bit before his career had even started. So mm. I don't know. It's just very like, it's just a little bit apples and oranges. Uh, and and Bell goes, you're basically comparing apples and interstellar spacecraft. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're just like the, I don't know. It just seems like the arguments kind of fall apart and they. Eh, uh, uh, yeah, it's just yeah. it's just like it just doesn't make sense is the problem um so uh well, the whole point of a deflection i think going. is very important yeah. of it sort of like i got that feeling yeah. so something you mentioned that i didn't know about is how that chevelle's had multiple of these um specials on netflix that came out uh post yeah. all the like criticism he got and i only knew about the one and watched the one but I definitely got that feeling of it was sort of like, let me, let me like, all, it, it was just such, it felt kind of backwards. It's kind of like, let me drill on this topic and make fun of it enough to kind of in a backwards way, make you ignore what I had done previously. Like it's a way of me like apologizing for, but not apologizing for what I had done before. And it just felt so backhanded. It felt so deflection based, but but the wrong kind of deflection. You know, normally you're not like, hey, don't look at this shiny thing over here. Look at this same shiny thing over here that I'm making fun of. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's like yeah. they're both the shiny thing. It's like, why are you doing this? Um, except yeah. you're, you're yeah, now like, you're you know, it's now you're just like making fun of it. And it, it just feels like a repeat. It feels like a repeat of the previous thing. And I haven't right. learned. The, I think the most important thing really is that like there just are black trans women. Um, and so the fact that Chappelle did not spend any time listening to these women and how they felt about his special and like because many times in the special he goes queer people or trans people would go through like 
the same talking points to him based on some article that was written about him 16 years ago when he was making transphobic jokes on stage. But Mm -hmm. he never really says what those same talking points were. So there's no real effort to address them. Like you don't know what criticism he even really heard or what he tried to adapt to because he's not saying it, (laughs) you know, he's not saying what those talking points were. So instead he just, brings up stuff to keep bolstering his argument, which is like, why doesn't, why don't people care about me and like my suffering, which is the larger empathy point that I'm about to get to. Um, That's like like deflection empathy. It's like, yeah, I'm trying to stand beside this person who's going through a shitty situation, but know who else went through a shitty situation? The person who's beside them, me, (laughs) you know, like it's very like, yeah it's like you're you're ultimately not empathizing with this other person because you're trying to focus it on the other person or yourself meaning you know so it just it feels so odd as a choice yeah yeah so uh coming up on the end here bell goes it's only the last 16 minutes of your closer that really pisses me off again dave some of us are black and when i was growing up in the midwest there was never a shortage of racist white dudes to tell me about their black friend who gave them permission to say the n-word I hear you, Dave. I hear you holding up our fellow comedian, Daphne Dorman, as the good Teesler who never made Dave feel bad for being transphobic. Daphne Dorman, your quote unquote friend, who you describe as a terrible comedian multiple times, often like spent more time making fun of how Dorman was a bad comedian than uh, talking about their friendship. Like five or six times is just like she bombed so hard on stage. You will not believe how hard she bombed on stage, how bad of a comedian she was. But in her heart, she was a comedian. She was funny off stage. It's like, what point are you trying to make, man? Um, so Bell goes, yeah, who you describe as a terrible comedian and didn't know she had a child until reading her obituary after she had killed herself eight days after the one time you spent any significant amount of time with her in person. As if that weren't insulting enough, you then double down as though you were representing a greater community to her than her trans community, um, meaning the community of comedians. Uh, cause, Cause Chappelle goes, you know, I never saw Daphne Dorman as a, as a trans woman. I saw her as a comedian first. And I don't know. There's something like very like kind of erasing about that as well. (sighs) So Bell closes saying, um, as though you were representing a greater community to her than her trans community. And I have to wonder how many quote unquote transgenders knew her, loved her, supported her and encouraged her that you erased so cavalierly in a community with an abnormally high rate of depression and suicide that's the part that hurt every transgender person i know has lost someone by suicide and rarely has the reason ever been what other trans people have said to them on twitter hell you said it yourself dave quote twitter isn't a real place or sorry twitter isn't real close quote the marginalization mockery dehumanization and violence many of us face every day of most of our lives is what fuels our despair for you to use daphne's tragedy as your closing tag is the only thing you've done that's made me angry enough to write a letter signed mix dahlia bell pronounce she her <sighs> so i'm just gonna let that <laughs> sit for a second so it's like it's great like I was so close to trying to defend Dave Chappelle when I was writing notes for this episode and I stopped myself and I said, David, you need to see what trans women of color feel about this special. So I did a Google, Robert, you You know, that thing, you know, that thing that's free that almost everybody has access to in their pocket all the time. Yeah. 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 That thing, (laughs) that thing, (laughs) I used it to check myself. And I'm very glad I did. And that's why I wanted to read this because I'm just like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, we just listen to the people who are the authority on their own experience. Mm -hmm. And then after you do that, respect what they're saying. Like, stop trying to tell them that they're wrong about their experience. And once you get there, you get closer to empathy. Whew. Yeah. So yeah. Oof, deep. Like this, it. I like it. This is a couple of my questions about empathy. We can talk about them. Okay. Um and uh yeah, let's just let's just get into it. So I said this before. Is it possible to empathize with someone who is criticizing you? <sighs> criticizing you directly or just criticizing 
something that you share? Well, there's two different versions I heard of this. There is that. And then you also talked about where you have two different people criticizing each other. Which right. one do you, do you want yeah. to hear about? Well, well, I think, I think invariably it becomes two people criticizing each other. So let's talk about that. Okay. So my gut reaction to this would be um, that the thing that is ultimately going to overcome the criticism and the battle is a person who has a greater empathy. Yep. That's and, and, and it's like hard to quantify something like empathy in terms of like levels or grades or amounts. But it's just like the, to me, it's sort of like the person who can empathize the most, the person who can really drop their guard, drop their weapons, drop their attacks and just be like, OK, I'm going to be, for lack of a better term, the bigger person, the higher road. Mm-hmm be like what is it that like bothers you so much or what you know it puts you in such a negative angry whatever space that you're throwing this at me so that i can understand you and then maybe move beyond this because otherwise it's just to be a constant battle it's like city versus city country versus country you know war right um where they're just like going to keep fighting until somebody just says okay i'm gonna stop and i'm gonna try to understand you more than you're understanding me yeah my thought yeah yeah i I basically agree. And then I only, I really only add to that. Like I am certain that people who have multiple levels, multiple layers of oppression on them because of their identity or whatever are tired of being told to be the bigger person. And so Mm. until we have people with like slightly (laughs) more privilege to like much more privilege Mm -hmm. until they acknowledge that like it is their responsibility to be the bigger person and to be more understanding and to elevate people who are quote unquote like below them uh in terms of how oppressed they are then we're not going to get anywhere because like unfortunately and like that's why i want to talk about this is because like allyship is helping somebody without making myself the center of that helping Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. so it's so important to listen to what other people are experiencing and then explain to people who are not going to listen to someone outside of their identity. So if I talk to other light skinned people or I talk to other gay people who like don't get it, Mm -hmm. that that's me being an ally. It's not like no one else is part of that conversation. It's just me and this person who like doesn't get it. So I referred in our gender episode to a lot of conversations that I had with my older brother, um, where we were talking about trans issues for years, like just years, <laughs> like mm-hmm. he would come up with these questions that basically came from, you know, more conservative areas of the internet of like, is transness a mental illness or are trans people trying to trap people and like regain power by like leveraging police against them and like all of this like mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm just like, dude, that, is fear mongering and you are just not listening to trans people. I can tell. And so like we would have such long conversations about this stuff. Um, and oh yeah. And like the sports conversation, it's just like, you know, there are these people who are not going to use Google. They're not going to use the internet and these free resources to listen to authorities on the source. They're going to listen to <laughs> secondary opinions or like, Third hand opinions to try to understand it better, yeah. you know. Or so gonna, like, like if we take the uh, uh, the U.S. election where you know Trump came into power for the first time, I guess only time, mm-hmm. um, where it's like what they're going to get from the results, thanks to AI and algorithms, is going to be a lot of the opinion they already have. So it's just exactly. going to reinforce them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which leads right into my next question: is like how do you how do you build curiosity about people who are different from you? You know. I think it is like a very like it can be a scary thing to actually like go out there and be like, I don't know anything about Indian culture, for example. Like what pre what do you call what presuppositions, what uh, preconceptions Preconceptions, do I have about Indian people based on my really limited experience with them? And how can I have those ideas if that represents almost a billion people or something crazy. Mm. Like it's huge. Is it more and than so, a billion? 
they're probably over a billion now. Yeah. Just the population of India. Um, and you can extrapolate that to any identity, whether it's like skin color, country, sexual identity, ability, neurodivergence, age. literally everything. Age. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Age. <laughs> That's a good mm -hmm. one. Um, so I think honestly, like the only way to build curiosity about that stuff is to like be ready to be wrong, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that comes <laughs> before even that. Well, yeah, you got to go and prep like that, but I think you need to listen. Yeah. And you need to have the time to listen. And I think that's one of the hardest things is that like, Ooh, yeah. There's so many of us that go through life um, with our day-to-day -day busyness and things are going on. And a lot of that's legitimate. You know, a lot of people have like just responsibilities, their kids, their job, their friends, their family, their community, whatever that they throw a lot of time into. And every now and then you might actually get an opportunity. I feel like it's almost rare to be like, today I'm going to educate myself on this particular minority. Uh, that probably doesn't happen very often. But you'll get an opportunity every now and then to encounter one. And probably it's like, hey, meeting you for the first time at a party. Nice to meet you. Sorry to hear that went that happened for you. Moving on, I'm going to go to the next positive conversation. So you really need to take those opportunities when they come up to stop and listen a little bit and hear and do that empathy and like make it a practice and go through it. Because not only is it going to grow your skill and empathy, but it's also going to kind of you're making that conscious decision to stop and provide the time necessary to listen to that person because in by listening to them, you inevitably process it. Even when you walk away from that conversation and you think about it and you're like, oh, that changes my perspective on what I knew. Like me, as um, a gay man, I got a lot of my knowledge around the trans community in the last five to seven years because it wasn't in the spotlight before and there wasn't a lot of opportunity to understand it. And I didn't have a lot of people who were out about their status. And it finally gave me an opportunity to start thinking about that stuff and listening to them and change a lot of my perspective. Yeah. 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 There's, I think there's two big things real quick. I don't know if status is the right word, but just like open about their gender or like their pronouns. Cause mm -hmm. status has like a different connotation, I think, but I don't know. True. Um, I guess I use that more as label, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then the second thing was like, that idea of like being at a party with someone who's different from you. Like I felt very caught in the middle at a party one time where a pretty like hard conservative was talking to a trans woman and the trans woman was like basically approaching every argument saying like, okay, well this is how this legislation directly affects me and like my like health concerns. And then the conservative person was like, well, these are the systemic reasons why the economy is built this way and why we need these certain like rules and regulations in the government and uh, to keep like a stable society. And basically just like talking about completely different things. Mm -hmm. And so like that's really huge is like when we like I know I'm talking about systemic issues, but you have to have like the context for both, like be aware of systemic issues while also being able to have a human conversation with someone and not start citing all the, like the statistics for why you're right versus acknowledging <laughs> the person yeah. in yeah. front of you and like how they're feeling about what they're saying, you know? Well, and I think, I think that's a <sighs> difficult one that a lot of people don't create a delineation on in developing empathy yeah. and, and, there are those opportunities, sometimes rare, depends on the person, how many times you come across this, but those opportunities to be like, okay, we're talking about this thing that I may not necessarily agree with, but I know that this person is expressing something painful for them, something they've been through, something that was difficult. And I kind of have a choice between kind of just pushing the argument from just a kind of being right perspective or, or like educating them as opposed to this is my empathy opportunity to stop and listen and empathize with them. Even if I have a difference of opinion, that can come up at a later point and a different opportunity, maybe when you're in a formalized discussion, debate scenario, whatever that might be. But in that particular moment, it might just be as simple as like, I'm gonna draw my high road or my rightness and I'm going to just listen and empathize with this person and be like, that's really tough. I have yeah. a little bit more education. I'll absorb that in, I'll walk away and I'll, and I'll balance that with what I know. And I might still think I'm right. I might still think I, 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 if this was an argument that I would come out on top, but 
fuck did that person ever need that moment? And it didn't matter about whether you're not you're right or wrong. And they just needed empathy. Yeah. Yeah. I've said this before on the podcast, but my therapist says, you know, you're listening when you stop thinking about what you're going to say next. <laughs> and listening. it's so hard. <laughs> It's draining. And that's why you have like, you know, mm -hmm. trained therapists who like they can only take so many clients in a day because it drains their energy because they have to sit there and actively listen. For sure. Um, so these are possibly these are just like questions to mull over. Feel free to revisit this part of the podcast at minute 36 ish. I don't know. <laughs> so these are these are my questions that I will literally just be asking myself when I feel like my empathy is limited um, towards someone. Look at your pain and your fears. Do you have negative associations built from earlier in your life? Is that fear reasonable? Why or why not? And Again, like as I go through these questions, I genuinely believe it is not the responsibility of like majorly oppressed people to like to have to meet people halfway more than they already have, you know? So this is not meant to like whatever be that critical of like trans women of color, for example. Next uh thing is look at your successes. Who helped you? How hard was the struggle? Be honest with yourself, right? Like when I look at my successes and I look at who's helped me, I looked at how I struggled. Like I can acknowledge that I was struggling, that I was having a hard time. And I can also acknowledge the people who helped me and the ways that not everyone gets that kind of help, you know? Mm -hmm. Next one, look at your closest friends. Who do you surround yourself with? Do you always agree on things or do you have a range of opinions among your friends? Literally just like, you know, just do you have diverse friends? I know that's like kind of a taboo topic, but it's like, do all your friends look like you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. or, or just like, have the same opinion uh, as you. Do you have some? Or just have the have same opinion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, next one. Do you actively look for information to challenge or grow your worldview? If you never do, you will never be able to begin a conversation with someone who's quote unquote other in your mind. Like, you know, like. And I want to add to that too, like you can always ask, <laughs> sorry, I'm stuttering. It's okay to say like, hey, this might be a really stupid question. You don't have to answer it. And then ask the stupid question that you have in your mind. Um, and then respect if the person doesn't want to answer it or has like a weird reaction to that question. Yeah. Because you don't know how many times they get that question. Yeah. And then you realize like, I've, I've said it, two times already google is free yeah <laughs> what if you ask google that question first <laughs> anyway <laughs> well and another thing is like for those who are wondering like hmm who are the other people in my life a great way to potentially answer that is like do you have anyone in your life you call the blank or a blank just kind of like Chappelle did because <laughs> then chances uh, are right those are the others in your life <laughs> yeah 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 you're like your token friends yeah 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 or like a specific thing yeah yeah ooh, ooh. next one uh Understand what your values are. We did an episode on values um, because that's a major problem with political disagreement is people have different values that led them to their political conclusions. So when I'm arguing with you about whatever political thing, if I'm talking to you from my values and not talking to you from your values, you won't understand why I came to that conclusion. Isn't that weird? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird and yeah. that's why empathy is so hard because people have different values and if you can't even like if you don't know where they are or you can't even guess where they are then you can't like appeal to that person mm. or like appeal mm. to their better nature or like find the argument that's going to convince them yeah. so i want to put that out there that's almost worth a whole other episode <laughs> which it is listen to us talk about values <laughs> um Okay, almost done. Um, the next one says, are you trying to be mature or are you trying to win? Be honest, which is what Robert was talking about before. Mm. Next one is, this is the biggest one. This is like, this is the hugest one. Do you try to cultivate love for the human race? Why or why not? Do you think humanity is doomed? Do you think only certain people like are going to make it? And like, 
why why do you have that belief like <laughs> it's like anyway <laughs> well i I've, i mean i've had a that's a particular one that i've had a hard time with um and there's two points to this one is that i think you should really question yourself of like am i battling arguing or try to put down another person or concept that is based off of love then you really should ask yourself because for some people it's like you know with the queer community in most cases it's about i want to love another person and i just understand who i want to love why would you want to fight that or in the you know for the trans community uh it can be that right that's orientation versus like identity is like they're just trying to love themselves and why would you want to battle that right like it's about just coming to terms with who you are in terms of your gender and so it's just why why would you want to fight that so my second point is, is like this is where sometimes i feel bad as a person part of the queer community is like sometimes i'm just like why are we putting cycles and trying to defend uh you know our, our you know like i feel simple in terms of the world of problems i'm just like why why are we putting energy into just like you know i just want to love another person whereas like there's things like poverty and famine and you know climate change that these are things that aren't that like i feel are bigger than what our problems are and there should yeah. be more energy put into fighting that yeah yeah and like i don't know if that's a controversial opinion right like some people see it as another deflection to say like that's a what aboutism. Like we should solve social issues before we can tackle existential issues like climate change and poverty and stuff, mm -hmm. um, and war, <laughs> like all the big ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think we just need to pay attention to both, right? Yeah. Like we can we can build our love for people, like just love for the human race, while also fighting for these existential issues and like against the people who you know aren't paying attention to the climate mm -hmm. or the limited resources in the world and all that stuff so like ultimately the question that i want to leave this on is like do you want to spend your life fighting at like the peak of your intelligence for a better world like for your children and grandchildren are you personally pessim like so pessimistic that you want to be the last generation do you really want to be Oof. the last generation you know, because that's what people are talking about now. There's a lot of people who almost treat it as like a joke or a punchline of like, yeah, if the world is around in another 20 years kind of thing. And it's like, are we really there? You know? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're like, we're not going to get past it without empathy. And so I don't know. My last <laughs> my last quote is from Fleabag, the sitcom. Oh, so just one character where one character just says people are all we have it's really true yeah it's really true robert <laughs> like was it, wasn't it the really lesbian she has a discussion with in a bar yeah 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 <laughs> like everything that has ever made you happiest in your life has been because of another person yeah and if anything we should learn that to always take your advice from a lesbian in a bar <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so I don't know. That's that's all I really got about empathy. Do you have other thoughts? Any closing comments? <laughs> For me, it's just about I think empathy is hard um, because it often means you have to shed your precognition, your presumptions, your yeah. um, just what you think, you know, and what you think is right. And you have to let it go and just sit and listen and, and try to put yourself in the shoes of that another person. But you never will You can try to have the most closely resembling shoes that you slip on and try to be as close to that person as possible based on your own life experiences. But at the end of the day, you can't. So you just have to provide them the opportunity to give you more education and understanding so that little by little we learn, we grow and hopefully apply that to, you know, future encounters. Yeah. Yeah, because like what I started thinking about it as I was writing these notes was the experience I had with my last roommate where I was just like, OK, I empathize with this guy, but it actually isn't doing anything for making my life easier. And so that's why it's like when you have limited resources, like when I was living with him, I was looking for work and I was slowly draining my bank account because I was paying rent again and um, I was studying. So I had like very limited resources and 
like we made some agreement to not really see that many friends. So I wasn't even getting much social support either. Mm. Um, and I got like so in my head about it. And that was probably like one of the hardest places to try to find empathy for this guy. So even at the very end when like it ended badly, I've told Robert this whole story <laughs> just on a personal level, but I'm not going <laughs> to say it on the, on the podcast. Um, we fell out like he just never wanted to speak to me again because he figured I was gossiping about him and spreading lies about him. And so like, I can empathize with where he's coming from. Like he just, his background in life made it easier for him to take that road than to continue talking to me and actually figure out what happened, what our differences were and really talk about anything. Like he couldn't have a direct conversation with me about anything real. He would always like wait and let it build up or blame me for it or just minimize it or whatever. And Mm. it was just tiring. And so like empathy has limits, which is why I was kind of like acknowledging what was going on here. Like I can't empathize with someone if I'm in a scarcity mindset or if that person is directly criticizing me and that's what he was doing. And so it was just like, okay, well I need to remove myself from the situation. Lo and behold, like a couple weeks after being out of that living environment, I felt way better (laughs) and was just like, okay, I have some space in my mind if this guy ever wants to talk about this stuff again. Um, But we probably won't because he doesn't value empathy. (laughs) And that's why that conversation doesn't go anywhere. You know, I could try to appeal to his sense of whatever logic or rationality or something and show him how he's not being rational, but that takes so much work, you know, and that's why empathy is hard. It's yep. hard, hard work, you know? Yeah. And I would almost compare this a bit to spoon theory, which I learned about through a friend who has a- Wow, tell uh, me more. <laughs> I've never heard of this. Do you know, don't know about spoon theory? Uh, and I don't know a lot about it. I had learned it through a friend. Oh, okay. I think I have a guess, but continue. It's it's often associated people who have some sort of, um, oh, I'm going to use the wrong term here, but like a uh, emotional, physical, like- disability or something something that kind of prevents them from really fully engaging in life and that and the whole concept is like you have a certain number of spoons of the day and doing certain activity takes away those spoons for certain people they have less spoons because of their condition that they live with um or doing a thing takes more spoons than another individual who doesn't have the condition but ultimately the idea is that we only have so much energy in the day right and um because empathy is hard and hard things take energy going to lose those spoons so if somebody has a lot going on in their life or they have a lot of disabilities or something they can't they just can't, they can't they don't have the brain cycles they don't have the physical stamina to be able to handle that stuff and to handle that empathy and so i think that's where you get a lot of people who it's especially those people who are kind of hard and, and it's really hard for me because you know i'll come across somebody who's like got a tough life living in a tough area not maybe in a necessarily well-educated place or a place with a lot of adversity where they have a lot of exposure to that. So they're just never have the time or the spoons to grow their empathy and grow their ideas and, and um, because they just run out of time. And so like for you and others, I think sometimes it makes sense to remove yourself from the situation or to change up your situation in order to get your like feet back on the ground and have enough energy to deal with these situations a later point in life where you have the spoons, you have the time. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people stick through it. So it's like really hard to sometimes be like, you just want to be like, why can't you just fucking be woke? You know, <laughs> like why can't yeah. you just be like, you know, um, and much in the same way we want people to empathize on one side of the fence. We also have to empathize on the other side of the fence for the opposite side. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just tough. Yeah. Yeah, because I think at the center of that problem is nobody really wants to be told that they have privilege, you know, like, especially if they don't believe in that concept. But like, yeah, I've had conversations with white men who don't believe in privilege, like they just don't get it Um, where it's like, you know, I, I spoke to a white man who was just like. Listen, like I've all I've only worked blue collar jobs. I've always been struggling. Like I've never been financially stable. Like why do people keep telling me I have privilege? Like that's so irritating. Mm. And I get it, right? Like when I'm in that conversation with that guy, I'm like, yeah, people shouldn't be telling you that. Um or like 
there's a better way to have this conversation, you know? Like, yeah. really, the only question that comes out at that point is like, okay, well, would your life have been easier if you were a woman? Would your life have been easier if you had darker skin? Um, like, little questions like that can maybe get them somewhere, but it really, like, until until you meet them at their pain, they're not going to, like, listen to what you're saying because their pain is unacknowledged. Yeah, which is interesting because they're looking for empathy to feel yeah. heard and understood and that to provide them the space and the vulnerability and the trust to then provide you empathy for your situation. And it might be even the empathy to understand what you're bringing them, bringing to them. So if you're coming in with a conversation about privilege, and they're just like, I just don't understand it. I'm like, I'm not privileged. I've had a hard, shitty life. That could be very true. And they need the opportunity to express that so that that opens them up the possibility of understanding why they might be privileged why they might yeah. be like in a situation they've never considered because they're too caught up in their own shit, their own problems, yeah. their own difficulties until they can overcome that or get space from it. Will that give them the spoons, the time to then learn something new and grow? So it's like, yeah. it feels a little like uh, fucked either way, you know, like a Heinz, no, right. Like 20, 20, uh, it's um, just like something's got to give. Like that's yeah. that's what comes in my mind. Yeah, just like the movie. I don't know. I never watched. <laughs> I don't it. know what the movie's about. Isn't there a movie called Something's Got to Give? Isn't I think it so. Like, I think it's a comedy. It's a I think it's a rom com. Yeah. <laughs> it's really completely unrelated. Yeah, something's got to give. Yeah. Someone, someone's got to get horny enough to take their clothes off. I think that what that movie is about. <laughs> I uh, want to see it now. <laughs> let me look it up something's got to give is a 1962 film starring marilyn monroe and dean martin okay and then there's a 2003 one with jack nicholson and diane that's Keaton. the one yeah the yeah. jack nicholson one i know oh god wow okay yeah something's got to give like halted production because marilyn monroe passed away um like while it was filming i think she did yeah <laughs> Wow. I'm oh, joking. God. God. <laughs> <That's>, everyone. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe's not alive anymore. She's dead. When did she die? Um, ooh, okay. We're getting off track. But uh, there was one little thing that you said that jumped out. Um, <sighs> maybe I lost it. Maybe is it providing space for other people so they can provide it for you? Yeah. Yeah. Just the something's got to give feeling um nah i mean that's pretty much it is just like oh boundaries i think th like boundaries are so important um because in this like situation with my roommate like i realized like my boundaries were, were just like being crossed left right and center like i was just not being respected in this place i was mm -hmm. not given equal footing so when i'm recognizing how often those boundaries are being crossed i can say something about it which i tried for a while or I remove myself from that situation. And so I think like just knowing, yeah, just knowing how much energy you have, like you said, how many, how many spoons you have to be able to give that empathy for people. Like that is a boundary that you have in yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. Hmm. Wow. Okay. I think let me, let me do a closing yeah. How do I, how do I want to put this? Um, cause I almost want to do some improv, but I feel like we could just leave it there Yeah. cause we've I done like so. 55 minutes. Yeah. 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 I, I think I'm okay. Just leaving it there. Not doing improv. <laughs> yeah. Seriously? Yeah. I just don't feel in an improv yeah. mindset right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So I will cut ahead to this next question. One sec. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's show. We're not going to do improv. I, I left a teaser at the start, I think. I think mm -hmm. I mentioned maybe we would, and I've decided I'm going to respect my personal boundary, my spoons, and not do improv <laughs> at the end here. Cut it off. So, Robert, what is your takeaway? Empathy's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to, when you have the time, the spoon the energy, whatever you want to call it. When you do have those opportunities to exercise it, but you're given that fork in the road between like, I'm going to listen to this person or I'm just going to move on. 
take the former. Just try for, you know, every now and then just to grow yourself and change your opinions and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, You're going to fuck up along the way, but you're also going to grow if you at least provide those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love that. That reminds me of a something, a speech, like, what do you call it? A public speaking teacher told me once he was like, Mm -hmm. every interaction you have is an opportunity to change or be changed. And I'm just like, damn, 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 so true. <laughs> damn. Damn. <laughs> so that's my takeaway. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for listening to Tissues of the Day. You can follow me, David, at BitButton on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow Robert at Robert F. Mackay on Instagram. Subscribe to BitButton on YouTube and turn on notifications if you like, or just leave a like or a comment. Leave a dislike. I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's all engagement to me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's a chance for change <laughs> um finally if you really love this show you can support us or leave a tip at patreon.com slash bit button stay wet internet <laughs> that was me gargling <laughs> that was like a lobster call <laughs> lobster do they make sounds yeah lobsters just foam at the mouth oh that's and sometimes true. they scream <laughs> when you put them in a pot yep dark uh, Robert, I love you. Thank you for letting me have this conversation. I love you so much. <laughs> we'll course. stop there. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>